Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our month, well, not month long, our year long series on municipal councils from across Canada, where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada to talk about themselves their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today, we're heading to my home province of Alberta, Canada, and we're heading to the southern west part of our province to the municipality of Crow's Nest Pass. And today, I'm sitting down with councillor for Crow's Nest Pass, Lisa Sigatek. Tack, I literally got it right the first time, and then I just got it wrong. <laughs> Lisa, welcome to the show, as I just screwed up your name. Oh, hey, you have not screwed it up. It's been butchered way worse than that. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So, Lisa, let's get the first question right out of the bat, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, my parents were quite involved in politics. My mom was um, a member of the Progressive Conservative Party way back in the day and was quite good friends with Peter Lougheed. Um, and so she always gave me a sense that it was my responsibility to be politically astute and to do my homework and make my own choices, which I really like. She never pushed it down on me. And so um, my mother was also uh, started her political career as a school board trustee here in the Crosness Pass when I was in junior high school. And from there, she ran two terms and then she ran for municipal council. And my mother was a councillor here in the Crosness Pass for four terms. And so I kind of grew up um, watching her political aspirations, watching what she did, watching how she made a difference in her community. And so when I went to university, um, I went to the University of Lethbridge and I joined the Young Conservatives and I was active in that association back in the day. And, uh, you know, it was just my parents were really good and smart and made us all be politically savvy and make good political choices based on what we wanted. But she made sure that we knew that politics was um, an honor, that people had fought for the right for us to have a, a chance to vote. And she never let me forget that. And so um, I've done the same thing with my kids. I've really pushed them to make decisions. Sometimes they call me up and and ask me why they shouldn't vote a certain way. And then we have a very frank conversation about what my feelings are. And then they come up with their own choices. So it, it's that's kind of where it started. So it, um, it, it, it opens yeah. up the question that I kind of was going to ask second, but you've sort of already mentioned it. I guess municipal politics and politics in general were talked at the dinner table growing up. If your mother was so actively involved and even to today where you're sort of talking about it with your kids as well. So was politics that thing that sort of bonded the family and why you got into it after your mother did? Absolutely. Um my 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 first memory of my mom in politics, and, and I, you know, it's it's a funny story. Probably I can share it on here. I shouldn't share it other places, but I'm going to share it with you. Is Pierre Elliott Trudeau came to the Crow's Nest Pass and he threw a baseball. And as he was throwing the baseball, my mom yelled out, "You son of a bitch, get out of my community!" That <laughs> was my. I was I don't know. I was young, but that's my first foray into politics and how much she disliked Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And so she really was really good about. Um, not only keeping us in politics, but making sure that we used our voice in the way that we can't, that we should. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's around the table. My kids have been involved. We talk about it on a regular basis. Um, it's very interesting because my two oldest sons are in university and there's definitely a different teaching pattern that goes on in universities when it comes to politics, both provincially and federally. And, um, and so often they'll come to me and, and ask me what my opinions are on certain things. And, and I always have to remind them um, about what they need to think about because it's, it's, they're quite, it's, it's really interesting. They're quite indoctrinated. Um, a really good example is my one son came home when they raised the tuition in Alberta. My one son came home. He was at University of Lethbridge and he said, I'm going to the, the steps of the legislature and I'm going to find out exactly, you know, they've raised my tuition mom and it's my right to, to protest and I said absolutely that's your right like fantastic what are you protesting and he said well they raised my tuition and I said but honey how much did they raise your tuition and he said well I don't know my chancellor said I have to do this and I said well how about you do a bit of research and tell me how much did they raise your tuition and it turned out and he walked down to his bedroom with his head a little bit hung low because he knew he should have done a better job and he came up and he said he didn't want to tell me and I said how much Karen and he said two hundred and sixty eight dollars 
And I said, so, so you think it's, it's the public's responsibility to pay for your education or is some of that your responsibility? And what do you think is a good choice? And of course he made what I felt was a better choice, but it was, that's the kind of stuff that we saw happening. And so I feel as a parent, it's my responsibility to say, that's true, but have you looked at it from a, a, a wider perspective? And so those are, those are interesting things that have happened. The same thing happened to my other son, who's at U of A, he's in engineering, mining engineering. And he called me up and said in the last election, why shouldn't I vote NDP? And I said, well, you know, you can, like, what is your choice? What do you think is important? And he said to me, um, well, I, I read the platform. I really like them. This is what I'd like to do. And I said, well, that's great. And I said, honey, what are you taking? And he said, oops, sorry. He said, I'm taking mining engineering. And I said, well, then if you're going to vote NDP, you should get out into a different faculty because then you're a hypocrite. And those are the conversations that we have around the table. And so he really thought about that and said, you're right. I can't vote that way and go into mining engineering. So it's, you know, these are the things that we talk about on a regular basis in our family. And I wish more Canadians would do that. I think I think the idea of open discussion is a key cornerstone, particularly at municipal politics, municipal governments, I should say, because that's the level of uh, government where people can exchange those ideas. Uh, in our pre-interview, he said th there is no whip to votes in municipal government. It's whoever has the majority of the votes, whether it be a seven-person council or an eight-person council or a nine-person council. They can't have eight-person council because that would be a deadlock <laughs> if there's four and four. But the majority yeah. of votes wins, and it's always best uh, uh, on your decision making and your education of the issue that's in front of you that's the education of the issue for, for that is the key word yeah for someone that's who saw her mother in school board trustee counts uh as an elected official and then as a counselor what made you in 2017 to say okay it's time to put up or shut up. I'm going to get involved because I saw how it affected my 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 family with my mom, mother being a school board trustee and a counselor. And now it's time for me to take the same path as her after I don't know how long she was off council, but by the time you actually announced in 2017, you were running. But what made you decide in 2017, I'm going to follow in the in my mother's footsteps as a local representative instead of someone in Edmonton or someone in Ottawa? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think initially my aspirations were to go on a, on a little bit of a bigger level. I wanted to go into um, either provincial or federal politics at some point in my life. But I felt like I couldn't do that if I didn't do this first. So I think that, you know, we have a lot of politicians who go into those roles and they have no government experience whatsoever. And really, you know, even me as a person who had been involved in politics with my mom at a municipal level, when I got in, I knew very little. It was very surprising. I thought I was astute. I own the newspaper. I cover council meetings. I really felt like I was astute. I knew what was going on. And it honestly took me at least a year and a year and a, to a year and a half to figure out my role and what my what I could and couldn't do. So I wasn't crossing lines and I wasn't um, trying to run the municipality, but rather creating the policy and procedures in order for which my municipal um, leaders could run my community. And so I, I really felt um, that I feel very strongly that a lot of people who run have no clue what that is. And then they go in there and they waste four years of my life, of my of my of me as a voter, wanting them to do things, just trying to figure out where their place is in, in, the, in the food chain. And so for me, um, I felt like I needed to get my feet wet. I was seeing things in my community that I didn't, I didn't particularly like um, or agree with. And I'm not a, I'm not a bitcher. I'm a put up or shut up kind of girl. And so I put my name forward um, and I made it. So let's go back to that 2017 election, because I can imagine as someone who had owned the newspaper or still owns the newspaper to today, I'm assuming, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You you had an idea of what the pulse of the community was, the issues that were facing your community, <laughs> the issues that were in front of people. When you were out door knocking, talking to people, were there issues that even surprised you in that election that you went, holy crap, I didn't think people had this issue, but I'm glad someone's talking about it to me so I can sort of, if elected, help them? Yeah, for me... 
You know, for me, I've I've had a very privileged life. Um, you know, I, I have a husband that makes a good wage. I have had a good job. My children have had an ability to be educated. So I always felt like I had a very privileged life. My mother, on the other hand, um, also grew up in the Crow's Nest Pass. As an aside, my kids are literally fifth generation Crow's Nest Pass. We wow. have lived here for five generations. They immigrated from um, Europe to work in the coal mines. And so... Um, my mother lived here, but my mother was on a completely different level. My mother was very poor. Her mother was an alcoholic. She um, had to work to feed her and her sister. She had had me down close. She had a very difficult life in this community and grew up with nothing and was, was often um, a pariah in the community because she didn't have anything, especially back in those days. Um, however, she was incredibly smart and she was incredibly beautiful. And she was incredibly strong. And so you take all three of those factors in and she was a force to be reckoned with. And so she always instilled with me um, a need to take care of those less fortunate than me. And so when I ran, it wasn't it wasn't because um, I, I needed it on my shoulders, but there was a segment of our population in the Crows' Pass that is impoverished. We are 51, 52% of our population makes under $50,000 a year. No, 52% of our population makes under $50,000 wow. a year. And we are the oldest community in Alberta per capita. So we have people who have nothing. And we have people who work in the coal mines who are making a very good wage and we have no middle ground. And so when I ran for me, it was more to make sure that those people who are in the 52% and under were taken care of. And that when we were making decisions as a municipality, when we're raising taxes, when we're doing amenities, when we're doing all of these things, that we're keeping those guys, their perspective in mind. And so for me, I actually ran on the set on the fact that I wanted housing for people. I, I felt very strongly that if you give somebody a home and you make it attainable and you make it somewhere they can live, then you give them hope because that's the only reason my mother had hope. So those are the conversations that we had around the dinner table when my when my mother was running for politics. People always said she was a counselor for the people and she always took care of those who didn't have a voice for themselves. Do you try and, and emulate her. that though? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every decision I make is with the forethought of how will it impact the most um, vulnerable in my community. I want to and ask a, at the end wanna, of my first go, term, go ahead. Uh, just quick, at the end of my first term, we were on the precipice of, of creating an attainable housing and it didn't get done. And I really wasn't planning on running more than one term, maybe two. But at that point, a couple of my kids were graduating and I was ready to do something different. Um, and we hadn't finished the attainable housing project. And so I ran just because I want to make sure that we get something in place for these guys. I'm going to ask a question, uh, and I, I apologize if it seems like a very weird question to ask, but mm -hmm. your mother's name is what? Her name was Gail Rickson. Okay. So she, yeah. She, well, okay. her same last name as me, though. I didn't change my name. I'm still- Okay, so was, it was Gail Sigatak. Or Lisa Sigatak, and I will, and so was my mother. Yeah, so okay. I, I never- when I got married. So I want to, because you're the first person who has this unique story that I've never had the ability to ask this question to. So it's, I'm going to ask this question. Your mother, it was known in your community, your lifelong resident of your community. When you were out door knocking, did people say, oh, you're Gail's daughter? Oh, I remember Gail as a counselor. I, I'll vote for you oh, yeah. because I liked how <laughs> Gail was. And I'm not trying to say there was nepotism there. I'm just saying, was the Absolutely. name something else uh, attached to it that helped you sort of potentially get over that fear of going up? And because I'm assuming you're a, a reporter as well as owner of your newspaper, so you're not uh, a, a, afraid to go ask people questions. But was there a, a sort of a easing into politics because your mother had that name recognition already, and your name was her last name as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, she didn't make it on four elections because she didn't. People didn't love her. You know, my mom was really interesting. She was incredibly strong and she was incredibly tough. Um, and those when she was in politics, it was when there was not a lot of checks and balances between administration and council. So the council's pretty much ran administration back in those days. There's there's so many checks and balances in place now where, you know, we know where our line is. So we can't get into the the day to day operations of an organization. But back when she ran, they certainly could. And so there was a, a tremendous amount of power being a counselor back in those days that, that isn't there now. I mean, really, my job is to create policy and procedure. That's it. 
and to listen to people bitch at me because they do that a lot too. But, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's policy and procedure to, to bring your community to where you want it to go. But back in those days, it wasn't. And so she was a very hands-on person. She would be the kind who would show up, at, you know, if somebody wasn't running the dump truck right, she'd tell him to get out of the dump truck so she could run it. That kind of a human being. And so, oh yeah. And, and I ha- a fair amount of people wouldn't, they just wouldn't tangle with her. She, she had a temper. She didn't mind using it. She had a voice. She had a voice when women weren't supposed to have a voice either. So she had to be extra tough. Um, and so of course, when I ran, people would say, oh, that perfect. Like you're, you're, you're going to take care of us. You're going to be the voice of the people. She was always known as the counselor for the people. And so I really take that seriously. Um, and I always have an open door policy and I probably get more calls. In fact, I know I do because we talk about it at the council table. I get more people come through the door of my office, probably because it's it's accessible and more calls than I would, I would, would not be hesitant in saying more than any other counselor in the Crows Nest Pass just because of my mother did it. And so then therefore I will do it. So I want to go back to that very first time walking onto the council chamber's floor as an elected official. So it's after the election night in 2017, you have the check mark, you're officially declared the uh, new councillor elect for the municipality of Crow's Nest Pass. How much of a responsibility and weight do you put on your shoulders to make sure you do your job correctly? Because the decisions you make in that council chambers are not only going to affect your pocketbook, but the pocketbook of every single person in your community, your neighbors, your loved ones, your community members, your coworkers. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself in that first time walking onto that council chamber floor? And do you still have that responsibility put on your shoulders? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 you run and you're caught up in the, I can't talk, I'm just saying, you You run and you think that um, you're you're so caught up in in the election itself that you're really not thinking of what does that entail, right? And you're not thinking, oh, this is four years of my life that I'm giving up. Um, And so the day you walk in there, and, and I think I was a bit naive, like when I showed up for, for the oath, when we did our oath. I was by myself. I didn't invite my family and everybody was in there with their family and all the, and I'm here by myself thinking what's going on here. And when, when you're standing in front of the Bible and you're swearing, cause I swore my oath and you're signing the paper, you feel that weight of responsibility hundred percent on your shoulders. And that's the moment where you're like, Oh my goodness, the rubber hit the road. Like here I am. And this is what I have to do. And every decision that I make, I truly try to, to make that decision with the best form of knowledge that I have, but also wondering who it's going to impact the most. Um, and so those things, and, and four years later, it's every decision I make is how will it, Im- how will a, how will it impact people, but how will I benefit the majority of the people? Cause you're never going to make everybody happy. And sometimes, you know, and I haven't done it often. I did it once where you're talking. And of course we're, we, we have it covered by the media. And I made it, I I said something and it got misconstrued in the media and it's never happened to me before. And we were talking about um, the community wanting to be a tourist community. And one day I was driving down the street and none of the businesses were open on a Sunday. And my comment was, the point I wanted to make was, if you want to become a tourist community, you need to become touristy. I do realize that some of the, the workers that you can't get workers, that some people are lazy. And it's therefore hard for you to get workers, but we have to figure that out. And it got misquoted in the paper for me saying that business owners were lazy. And it blew up. It went viral. And that's the first time that had ever happened to me in five years. And it was a real wake up call that what I say really carries weight, more weight than I even think it does as a counselor. Because sometimes you just, you, you, you minimize what you're doing because it just becomes what you do. And then you forget that people are listening to you and that the decisions that you make and the words that you use actually matter. And so that was a really good wake up call for me. And I just got raked over the coals. Like it wasn't good. I apologize. I, I didn't apologize because I really hadn't done anything wrong. And I stood by what I meant. I, I really feel that if you want to be touristy, you have to open up and you have to figure that out. Um, so, but I did, I did, I did apologize for the use of the, of the word, but it was a real wake up call that we matter. Like the, I have to lead by example. So it, it was just, it was a good wake up call for me. You mentioned something there and I want to jump into it a little bit more if possible. You talk about your role as a counselor, but on the flip side, you're also the owner of the newspaper in town. Oh. 
And, and you, knew, you knew this question was coming because literally I asked, oh, I said I want to talk about it during the interview. You are the oh, second sure. you are the second uh, uh, elected official who's come on this show who is a a counselor and also a newspaper owner or publisher. Yeah. How do you balance that? Because I can imagine you want to be very, you want to walk the fine line that is editorial control, but also ensuring that your uh, reporters cover the town council meetings in a correct fashion. So how do you balance that, those two roles in this polarizing uh, life that we live in right now? Well, you know, I watched my mom. My mom also owned the newspaper before me. We've owned this newspaper for 93 years. I know, I'm like walking in her footsteps. So she owned the newspaper and was a counselor. And believe it or not, we um, one of the reasons why I didn't run earlier in my life was because we lost a tremendous amount of business. Like if she made a decision people didn't like, it affected us on a, on a fiscal um, platform. And so I had to be really cognizant about that. And also about, I have a big voice. I mean, we sell 3000 newspapers in a community of 6,000 people a week, like people are reading what we have to say. Um, and, and as an aside, I'm also the vice president of all of the newspapers in Alberta. I'm the vice president of Alberta Weekly Newspaper Association. So I carry that mantle. So I'm, I, you know, it's hard to go to my association and say, you know, I'm the vice president of all these weekly newspapers in the in the province and Northwest Territories, and yet I'm a counselor. So how do you govern yourself? And so really, I have no editorial control over anything that has to do with council related business. I don't even read it. And so when I hire my reporters, and I always I hire educated, you know, college educated reporters, the first thing I say to them is, you need to write what you read, what, what you, what I, what, what any of us say, and I'm never going to read it. And I, to this day, have never actually read a council brief. So you, I'm assuming uh, the paper, the uh, Crow's Nest Herald is what yep. it's called. Crow's uh, Nest Herald, yeah. Yeah, uh, it has an editor. So you're the owner and publisher, but there's an editor as well, or are you the editor no, as well? No, we don't have an editor because, I mean, we, as you know, or as the world knows, the newspaper <laughs> business is getting sucked by my, you know, by social media. So no, we don't. I mean, I, I'm the publisher, but I really, I, I, I really have to trust the, the reporters I hire because it's their responsibility to make sure that they're doing what they do and they're educated enough to know it. Um, we do have, we do have um, veteran people who have been in the industry for a number of years who I have go through it and make sure when it comes to council briefs um, that it, nothing is liable or it's crossing a line that way. But I don't change a word they say when it comes to council and my reporter will rake me over the coals when they have to. And, and, and I expect them to, because it, that's my check and balance, you know, and, and when I got caught saying the words, those words, that was a check and balance for me. Had it not been reported in the newspaper, I wouldn't have known that I said that and I wouldn't have realized how impactful my words are. And so it was a good, it was a, it was a good thing and, and it needed to be done. And, and I think as politicians, we're so busy trying to make excuses for what we do or justify our actions um, rather than when, when we make a mistake, rather than just saying, yeah, I made a mistake. Like, could I use better language? I'll, I'll be better next time. And that's the problem with politicians is they, they're not humble enough to recognize when they make a mistake. You are publisher, owner, counselor, and just mom. How do you yeah, balance those three that. jobs? Because <laughs> I can imagine going to the grocery store is the most challenging role that you ever have or going to get the mail because you are going to get stopped because people know who you are. You're you're yeah. the owner of the newspaper. You're the counselor. You're so-and-so's mom and uh, this daughter of uh, Gail. How do you balance yeah. that lifestyle in such a small community because I think that's a lot of people are trying to figure out right now is how do local politicians just not go crazy with the constant bombardment of calls, issues that yeah. are being raised? Do you ever just say no to people and say, I can't talk about it now. Here's my card. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I do actually. And it took me a while to figure out my boundaries um, because I do have four sons. When I ran the first time, um, my in 2017 Kieran would have been 19 I had a 19 year old I had a 15 year old and I had an 11 year old at home um and I 
I take being a parent the most important role I have in my life. It far surpasses politics. It surpasses my job. It surpasses everything I do. I take it very seriously. And I take, I'm a very, um, I'm really proactive in my children's life. And so um, what I noticed is when I would have, I would have date nights with one of my boys, we would pick a night and we'd go for a date. And oftentimes we would go um, for dinner or we, and we would walk in and I would see times when I would be walking with Quinn, the youngest one, and we would be going for wings, for example. And as I'm walking through the door to the table that I want to go to, I'm getting stopped along the way by people wanting to talk about counsel. And it took me a while to say to people, sorry, I'm having a date with my child. You can come to the office tomorrow. So I really try to run um, business hours. I My door is open from, you know, eight till four. You're more than welcome to come in at any time and talk to me. But off hours are off hours. And the other thing that I'm not very good at and that other politicians are, and, or maybe I am really good at it, maybe it's, I guess it's how you look at it, is when they have um, community events or dances or fundraisers or different things that happen on the weekends, I don't go to them. I spend weekends with my kids. I go to hockey games and I play board night with them and I go visit them in university and I have given weekends and parent time. That is my P1. And so, you know, lots of times they'll have these wonderful events and they want me to come. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I'm a mom first. Like I give you my, my time and my energy um, when I'm expected to at meetings and during the day, but when it comes to events for my kids or weekends, it's hands off. There's my, there's my line. And so I've been very good at, at, at um people just don't cross the line anymore it's great you well, before i turn to the last segment i want to uh, finish with this um you seem like a very personal person since you've been elected in 2017 are there people in your community because you own the newspaper who won't come to you because well i'm not sure if it's going to be published in the newspaper so i'm going to go talk to counselor y or counselor b because if i go talk to lisa it might get reported in the newspaper. Do you ever find that balance hard or is your community, because it sounds like your community is quite open with you and very honest with you. Okay. With the fact that you run both and are the publisher and you have that line where your reporters are the municipal reporters, not Lisa, the reporter. Yeah, no, I've never had a problem with it, to be honest with you. And I don't think they must have either because they voted me in a second term. So No, no yeah, it's just because no, the last council no, I, I talked but to. If they did though, right? But if yeah. they did, chances are they wouldn't have. And that was a good litmus test to see if, if I was able to kind of walk that line. No, I really don't. I, I don't think there's anything that people don't feel like they can come and talk to me about. And, and they do, like right down to... Somebody's got too many cats. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> the, Those are the, the good questions. Are just <laughs> like, really? Like, holy cow. Um, but you know what? It's been a privilege because I don't think of many people. I think municipal politics is true politics. It's it's one vote. Your vote matters. And how well you sell your vote or how well you sell your idea is how your council will vote. And I'm really cognizant of being open to everything, not coming in with preconceived notions, because I might have an idea of what I think is right. And then a different counselor, the mayor comes in and they give their spiel. And it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And that's, I think that's why municipal politics works versus federal. And to me, it seems like federal and provincial are just imploding. It's just, you know, you watch, you watch question and answer and nobody answers any questions. <laughs> you know, they're asking questions, nobody's answering them or they're answering them. It's about something completely different. Nobody wants to talk about the issue, truly discuss the issue. And at a council level, at a municipal level, you do. You sit at a table and you hash it out until you come up with how you're going to vote. And and I think if we ran the country that way, I think we, we the world that way, I think we'd have a much better um, quality of life in this country. Plus, at the council table, there is no party. You're, no. you're, you're Lisa. That's Todd. That's yeah. Jim. That's Jacob. So no. there is no party and there's no uh, partisanship. It's all for one cause. And that's the community. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, Everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case -case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. 
On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. I want to turn to segment two, and you've already let the cat out of the bag of what it is and its issues. So <laughs> before I st- uh, ask this question, I have to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is her opinion. This is not a motion at council. This is not a policy of council. <laughs> we seem to get Sorry. a lot of questions and answers about those. Uh, this question that I ask. So, counselor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the municipality of Crow's Nest Pass today well for us it definitely is um the fact that we're an impoverished community we have we are by definition when you're 83 percent of our it might even be 78 now 70 between 78 and 83 the number varies but um let's say 78 percent of our tax base is residential we have no commercial um industry in this community and so the brunt of the taxes are falling onto the residents of our community and the majority of the residents of our community are seniors who are on fixed incomes and so we are really taxing like not taxing in the sense of taxes but we're really stretching people thin and um we have to as a community figure out how to bring in some industrial tax base and of course, I'm sure you've heard we had the opportunity to have a coal mine here in the community, and that's become a huge, huge issue for the Crow's Nest Pass, because this community and this council has been pro-coal development, while the rest of Alberta has not been, and we had an opportunity to be successful. Um, the majority of the people who make a good wage in the Crow's Nest Pass actually drive into British Columbia to work at the, one of the biggest coal mines in, well, the biggest coal coal mine in in Canada and make an incredibly good wage Um, and that helps sustain the community but we don't get taxes from those coal mines because they're in BC and so um, for us it's how do we how do we get industry in our community so we can lower that tax base how do we build our community um, without putting more um, strain on on the seniors and what we're really finding now is during COVID, the Crosnes Pass was found as a tourism place because you could still buy houses here for a reasonable price. And we're really two hours from Calgary. So we're not that much farther than Banff is or Canmore, but you can still buy a house here for under $200,000 a year or $200,000. And so I'm just going to do this. And so what we found is um, that we have a lot of people from the city who are moving into the Crow's Nest Pass and buying homes to live here on weekends. Um, and what they're doing with that is they're increasing the value of the homes so that local people now can't afford the homes. And it drives up the assessment of the homes in the community. So then your taxes are more. And now we have a lack of housing. So now we, we, we just don't have anywhere for people to live and that's affordable. And so the, that's the issue that's really in our community is how do we thrive as a community? Um, how do we get industry in our community of any sort? Um, when we had one and it didn't work out, that was a real kick for us. And now it's all about tourism and tourism's great. I, I agree, tourism is a way to go, but tourism typically has minimum wage jobs. And so with minimum wage jobs and you have housing that's increasing, where are they even, where are they even going to live? So it's just, it's like, it's like a, an issue that's happening, but I don't think it's just us. I think it's all of rural Alberta that's in Southern rural Alberta is seeing these issues. We're just seeing it heavily because we're a bigger community. So you've asked, you've asked my question without asking the question for me, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And that is what's council doing to address this issue? You, you've talked about housing. That is a major issue that's across this country. The cost of living is going through the roof right now. Builders are not building as much as they used to be. Um, you talk about uh, uh, inflation and people struggling right now on fixed incomes. 
Well, the cost of living, the cost of doing business is going up. So service levels are going up. So that means you have to pay more for the services that you were getting three years ago. How is council addressing these issues in this uncertain economic time? Well, and you know, we got we just got hit as well because we were a specialized municipality. When we amalgamated in 1979, there was an agreement that the municipality would be able to access granting based on small population because we're made up of five different communities, but we could also access grants as a large community as a large um, entity. The Alberta government took away our specialized status. So we've lost probably over a million dollars in granting money. Um, for infrastructure. And you have to you have to also be really aware that the municipality starts at the Burmish tree and goes to the BC border. We have an, an, a, a massive amount of, of infrastructure that we have to um, take care of. And now all of these abilities for us to fund that infrastructure are being systematically taken away from us. And so we have that coming down the line. Then the Alberta government, of course, includes started to introduce the policing component where now we never used to have to pay for RCMP. Now we're paying $400,000 a year for RCMP. And potentially more our, if uh, the, oh, the cost absolutely. of living, the federal government's about to pass on. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and um, we just, just, just alone in utilities we had in our 2022 fiscal year, we saw an increase of $400,000 in utilities for our facilities. So, you know, all of these things come at you and you, you're like, OK, well, what do I do now? Like, can I ask the public for more money because we have no industry? So when the coal mines were coming, when there was an opportunity for us to have a coal mine, that would bring a significant amount. We've run a 17 million dollar budget. We would probably get around two million dollars. That's a lot of money um, out of, you know, at, for uh, an industrial or commercial income into the community. Um, and so we were kind of really excited that would have brought people into work here. It would have it would have just kickstarted the community with a good living wage. Uh, and we were really excited and we had built our strategic plan around that. OK, so our issue now isn't um, do we need it when it happens? How do we get from point A to point B? How do we facilitate the people? How do we get them in here? How many more doctors do we need? How many more teachers do we need? We're going to have an influx of young people. We were stagnant. We are stagnant. In fact, in the last census, our population for 18 and under decreased. Our population for seniors increased because people are retiring here, of course. So all of these issues were happening. We had a great strategic plan and then the mines didn't happen. And so then you kind of catch your breath and say, OK, what do we do next? And it seems like tourism is kind of we've been found or um uh, Travel Alberta has decided that we're going to be one of the pillars for tourism in their campaign. And so tourism is now kind of where things are going. And I'm all for tourism. Don't get me wrong. I think it's great. But I also it's. It's one need, part of the puzzle. It's one part of the puzzle. It could be it would be great. And I actually thought we could have a coal mine and industry at the same time. I think they're both they, they both can happen. But we need to we need to to figure out how to bring in industry. And we really don't know how to do that. They're not knocking at our doors and we don't know how to knock on their doors. And it really, really, quite honestly, and, and you know, watch my language, but it really pisses me off that every time you hear the Alberta government do something, it's never anywhere south of Calgary. It's always Calgary North and they're just pumping money into these communities and they're building factories and they're doing this and doing that. And we're on a major railway line. We're right by the BC border. We're right by where the busiest highway there is. And yet nobody bothers, especially when it comes to government built, you know, helping industry, giving them incentives to go. Nobody gives, they just don't seem to care about this part of the province. Like literally, I feel like we, if you look on a map, we end up Pritchard Creek. There is no Crow's Nest Pass on a map. Go look at it. We're That's... not even on the freaking map. Oh. So <laughs> if we're not on the map, we're certainly not in their radar for a community that should get something. And ironically, it's the government that said we couldn't have a coal mine and they're doing nothing to help us figure it out. So that was previous Premier Jason Kenney who said that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any optimism with this new premier and this new energy minister? Have you, has the council had discussions with uh, uh, energy minister, Peter Guthrie? I know I'm not, I'm trying not to make this a political show right now because I wanted to talk yeah. about this. It's just, do you see a silver lining anytime soon? Because we're coming up to an election. I'm assuming the people of Crow's Nest Pass want this to be a ballot issue. How do you make it a ballot issue without making this a political show? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you don't, right? You can't because it's out of our hands. I mean, the government brought in a third party group to make a decision and now it's it's following the procedure that it needs to follow. There's nothing we can do. Yeah. We have no ability to lobby for anything. Um, so really there isn't, on, on that front, there isn't anything that we can do. What we have to do is put that to rest. So what we have done as a community is we brought in, um, uh, oh, what is his name? He was a, a premier. He, did, he wrote the book, 11 Ways to Kill a Community. Um, oh, uh, Doug Griffith, 13 Doug Ways Griffith. to so we actually Yeah, 13 Ways. We actually brought Doug in and he helped us create a new strategic plan because ours obviously was defunct. We'd only made it two years ago and now we're back in making a new strategic plan. And so we're doing all the things we need to do to create that synergy to, to figure out, you know, where do we go and, and how do we move forward? People have to remember, like, we're not a small community. When you look at rural communities in Alberta, we, we have 6,000 people that live here. We're not a, we're, you know, we're not small. Um, we're not large, but we're certainly not small. And, um, you know, our, our, our voice should matter. So I don't know, you know, it's, governments aren't going to do anything in elections coming. They're going to give money away and they're going to please everybody that they can without actually committing to anything. That's just how government works. They're going to please anyone um, they can in Calgary and Edmonton. And I'm saying that as well, the political person right now. I don't even think Edmonton, to be honest with you, they'll, they'll please whoever they can in Calgary. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. It's Calgary's <laughs> what matters. That's the battleground. And they feel like they have the rules run, right? Yeah. They, they, they win on rural in Calgary. And so it's going to be, but I will tell you, there is a very strong NDP candidate running in this riding that's going to give whomever runs as a blue runner, as a UPC, or yeah, UPC, they're going to give them a run for their money. So not the, everything's up for, for grabs right now. And what you're also noticing in Alberta, without this being becoming too political, and here specifically too, is that you see a lot of people from BC and Ontario who are moving into Alberta and moving into this area as well. And they left their provinces because they didn't like what was happening there, but they're also bringing their political views with them. So they forgot why they left and they're bringing them with them. So it's really interesting how it, everybody says Alberta's blue, but it's really starting to dilute and it's going to be a super interesting election. I, I agree wholeheartedly and I'm looking forward to that. In, I'm looking forward to May, but right now we're talking about Crow's Nest Pass. Yes. So yes. I want to turn to our last segment because I am cautious of time. And I said an hour, I actually said 45 minutes and we're at the 45 minutes mark now. So hopefully you have at least five, 10 minutes left. Um, I want to talk about tourism. As I said, in every single episode that I've been doing in 2023, if you come on my show, I'm coming to your community. I'm coming to spend those tourism dollars in your community to drive some economic development in your community. So for those who are listening across this great country and around the world, because we have listeners in Germany and uh, Germany, Ireland, the UK and Australia, for some reason, hi, Australian people. Uh, what should people do while they're in Crow's Nest Pass? Oh, what shouldn't you do? We are such an untapped gem. So we're really fortunate in that we have cultural tourism is one of our big things. So there's traditional tourism, which we'll talk about, but we also have big cultural tourism. So we have, of course, the Frank slide, which is the largest rock slide in North America. Um, we dropped 90 million tons of rock through the, through, through the town of Frank in 1903. And so we have an interpretive center. Um, we have literally rocks for three square kilometers in between a highway. There's a graveyard in there. So we have the Frank Slide Interpretive Center, which is one of our um, historic sites. We also have Canada's worst mine disaster. We lost 189 miners um, in a coal disaster in 1914. And there's tours there. We have had the um, a rum running shootout in um, the Crow's Nest Pass in Coleman. And so Emperor Pick um, was in a shootout and Florence Lissandro, his partner, was hanged. She was the first woman hanged in Alberta. And we have a museum and we have the house in which the barracks were and in which he was shot. So we have incredible cultural tourism here. Um, you can actually go to the cemetery and go to the mass graves of the 189 young, young men who passed away in the mine disaster and hear all the stories. Um, in fact, my great grandfather was working in that coal mine and his best friend was coming in from Europe and they switched shifts and his best friend died and my grandfather made it out of the coal mine. And uh, so, you know, there's these stories, you, really like culturally, we're one of the most incredible community. We still have a Polish hall. It's very segregated in communities. We still have 
um, you know, all of these places that people can do culturally to visit. So that's one component of what you can do when you come to the Crow's Nest Pass. Oh, and we also have an underground mine tour. So you actually get all the gear on and you go into an actual coal mine. It's incredible. Oh. So you could spend a week just doing cultural tours here in the Crow's Nest Pass. Um, and then, of course, we have untapped natural beauty. We live at the, the you know, the, the head of the Rocky Mountains. We are a little tiny community surrounded by mountains. And what you get here that you don't get in Banff and Camor is you don't have to pay to come here and hike. It's free. And it's not commercialized. So every hike is is you're in the back country and you're seeing some of the most beautiful untapped raw um, vistas that you're ever going to see. And you're not going to see anybody around you at all. And um, I've hiked 52 peaks in the last couple of years in this community and the views are incredible. So we also have a ski hill in our community, a little tiny ski hill. And what we have is a very active mountain biking community that has turned the ski hill also into some world-class mountain biking. So we host mountain biking events, um, the trail running. We actually host what's called Meet the Minotaur, which is the only North American stop in the Skyrim tour here in the Crow's Nest Pass. It's a 33 kilometer, 3000 peak mountain race. It's European based, but we're the only stop in North America. And that's here in the Crow's Nest Pass. So you add all that up, you can actually hike into Lille, which is an old mining community, and you can see all the coke ovens and all the buildings. You can, what you can do here is incredible. It's it's culturally incredible. It's it's naturally rewarding. We often say naturally rewarding here. It's the most beautiful untapped mountain community left. I would say quite honestly, in Canada. They haven't found us yet. They're finding us, but they haven't found us yet. Well, now that I know, I'm not going to release this episode till after I visit your community. So that way I can see it beforehand. <laughs> but uh, you you had me at museum and underground mine tour. So I will be yeah. there. And hopefully uh, when I'm down in Crows, the municipality, uh, you and I can go grab a coffee and continue this great conversation. But I want to leave on this question. Uh, actually, I actually have two questions left. This question is uh, still on tourism. And that is after a stressful day. After a long day of work, after a long day at council, and you can't say your own house here, and I'm going to preface that, where do you go in the Crow's Nest Pass to decompress? Where do you go to get away and just reconnect with your community? And your Well, quite honestly, I'm training for Meet the Minotaur. It's one of the, I have had cancer in the last year, and, and my goal one year and four weeks post cancer is to race in the meet the minotaur race so when i'm done work and my kids are safe at home and i fed them i take my phone and i put it away and i put on my running gear and i run up my ski hill or i put my skis on and i skin up the ski hill because i like to go up the ski hill on my skis and then ski down and i don't do a day without spending it in the mountains of this community. My mother always said that this place is the Garden of Eden. And once you get here, you'll understand what I mean. So I guess you just painted the picture of my last question. And that is, what makes the Crow's Nest Pass such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? We actually care about the people that live in our community. So when I make a decision as a counselor, I have to also look those people in the face when I go to the grocery store. And so when you live in the community in which you help govern, it gives you a perspective on the decisions that you should make because it's real for certain people. And what makes this community truly beautiful is the fact that we've had so many disasters and so many things not go right in this community. And every time something happens, we pull together and we make this community bigger and better and stronger. And there's a sense of kindness and understanding to our neighbor that I have rarely seen in any other community that I've ever lived in. I work out of Calgary a couple of days a week. I do some contract work. And when I'm running on the trails in Calgary, I'll run by people and I, I wave at them or smile at them because that's what you do here. And they never wave or smile back. <laughs> and it reminds me every time why I live in the community that I live. It is it is the most beautiful community with people who actually care and take care of each other. And, and there's a sense of kindness here that I haven't seen in many other places. 
Counselor Sick Attack, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for the last hour and discussing yourself and your community. I, I always find it fascinating to learn more about communities, but learn about the people who actually, and I, I say this with all respect, make a difference in our community because you are the front line of our, our politics. You are the front line of the decision making, and I appreciate everything that you do. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I look forward to sitting down with you and grabbing that coffee when I'm down in Crow's Nest Pass probably in about two months. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll do some good tour and you'll come out of here knowing it as well as I do. Trust me. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody because it helps our society. It helps our democracy and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. For with that, this has been the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day and remember everyone, keep talking.